the book, is really considered probably the foremost thinker about healthcare quality issues, uh, about uh, how to fix a, a culture of, 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 of care that is often um, broken and, and has uh, medical mistakes, and he's been spending his life trying to reduce those. And so we're very fortunate to have this panel here. And with that, I think I would just throw this open to a first question to you. We're going to try to have a free-form discussion rather than speeches. Uh, and as soon as we can, open it up to, conver uh, to a conversation with all of you out there. Uh, Dr. Berwick, when, we, when most of us think about medical research, we think about clinical research about drugs or we think about, uh, you know, doing clinical trials on, on surgery or treatment procedures and trying to think about how one, one or another of those treatments might be better than another or developing a new treatment. What about research into care itself and about the continuum of care and what's working and what's not? Would you talk about that for a minute? Sure. Uh, first, thank you for having me here. And I'm honored and intimidated to be my co-panelists here. Uh, people of enormous uh, I've never sat with a, with a bite before. <laughs> <laughs> talk later. <laughs> uh, uh, so let me define some terms first and then I'll tackle your uh, terrific question. Um, this uh, general area of uh, uh, evaluative research, clinical evaluation research, has been widely, it's obviously widely debated, a lot of hot quest, uh, concerns about them. I'll just offer a little way to think about it, that, um, which may or may not be helpful. Uh, sometimes it means uh, when there's a problem and I come up with a solution, does, can the solution work? Does this pill work compared to nothing? Uh, that's evaluation of an intervention. Then there's comparative evaluation of alternative interventions. If I have, as the president said the other night, was a, blue, a red pill and a blue pill or something, uh, two, two, op two things, uh, which works better? That's comparative. That can be taken into the world of economics. I can compare them with respect to only effect, or I can also look at cost and effect. So I get a marginal estimate of the value of something better than something else. I get better better outcome for so much money. It's cost effectiveness analysis. And then the last, uh, not actually part of research, but connected to that is what you do with the information. You can, you can take any of those and make decisions or rules or policies based on them. And I think when, we, when we're talking about evaluative research, all, uh, peop, people have different ideas in, in play among those, those four. A um, general premise right now with respect to the field is that the volume of information that's available is both overwhelming and insufficient. It's a very funny problem. There are 41,000 clinical, uh, randomized clinical trials underway right now in the country according to Wikipedia in the world, and 5,000 medical journals. I, I'm proud to be a doctor. I've taken care of patients for most of my life. You cannot know what you need to know anymore. It's absolutely impossible. You need an intermediation. Uh, to help you uh, combine all this knowledge into rational action. It cannot be left up to the individual, and all, all doctors know that today. They need help. The, so there's, in one sense, there's a surfeit of stuff to use. In the other, other sense, when you look to see what has been studied, stuff that we really ought to have studied hasn't been studied. We, a lot of medical practice has never been subjected to evaluation. Because the FDA works with the something versus nothing rule, we tend to have more studies of a versus nothing than of A versus B. And so we have a pretty serious problem here in the research community of comparative effectiveness studies. The cost effectiveness studies are even more deficient. We don't generally look at the marginal gains and marginal costs. So there's a big research <coughs> agenda there. And I think most of the clinical community welcomes turning the lights on on this. It's, it's something I, we want to do well for our patients and we don't want to waste resources. Uh, where it meets public policy is around government funding for that inquiry and then use of the information by the government. Uh, Representative Towson made some comments about uh, the, the, the British solution to that since I you've mentioned my dalliance in England. Uh, <laughs> uh, they have formalized this. They have this National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, NIC, NICE. It's fabulous. Uh, it's a very, very disciplined, highly scientific, the best minds in the world thinking all the time about what, on all four of those, A versus nothing, A versus B, cost effectiveness, and then what to do with translating the policy. And the National Health Service takes it seriously. They take nice advice under advisement. And I think it's, a, it's an amazing resource, exactly a, a model for translation of 
information into usable, usable knowledge and a very mature, open dialogue in the UK. It's all, uh, log on to their website, it's all hanging out. You can see the conversation and the consideration underway. So from the viewpoint of classical medicine, we have a lot of problems, too much information and not enough at the same time. We don't have the formalities in this country for processing information that work. With respect more to your point, if you then look at what's being studied, it is, does tend to be machines and drugs and technologies. But when you look at def defects in American healthcare, like safety problems for patients or waste of resources or failures of handoffs and chronic illness or crafting journeys for patients, we're really, really coming up shy. We don't have a research investment in the country in the design of healthcare. Uh, that's a system design agenda that I think we're ready to tackle. I'd like, love to see a National Institute for Health System Design emerge, which really takes seriously. And this is not just opinions about what to do. This is, this is scientifically very difficult. There, there are issues in engineering sciences, queuing theory, um, operations research, uh, and they have to be contextualized to rural Louisiana or urban New York. This is a big, big area, and we, we haven't dignified those sciences yet. And I, I really think there, if, we, if we could come to me and value research to include that, that would be great. The last point Representative Townsend mentioned in his, in his uh, remarks yesterday, a very important point. Uh, most of the evaluative science we use for procedures is summative. It looks at groups versus groups. As he pointed out with respect to his own personal story, if you heard it, uh, we, we now have a methodological problem. We have, we, it's now time to get to individual knowledge building for application to individuals. Instead of saying group A did better than group B, I want to understand everything about the people in group A and the people in group B so I know which in A should be treated one way and which in A should be treated a different way. And th there's a methods frontier there that's very, very exciting. So that's more wonky than you wanted, but it's a start. No, it's a great start. And I, I, what I'd love to do is I want to come back to a lot of those issues. And I know that the audience does as well. There were a couple of things that you mentioned. You mentioned that this enormous productivity uh, of, of information, at least, uh, 41,000 clinical trials, 5,000 medical journals. You, you wade through these. Each one of them has 20, 30 studies in them. They come out every week or two weeks or month. Um, and so, Congressman Porter, I was, I was hoping that we might talk a, I might ask you a very tough question to begin with, which is, you know, is there too much research? going on. I mean, are we, you know, we've been funding research forever and ever and ever, and every once in a while you hear of this crazy study, some outlandish study that, that you know, critics of, of research dollars use to, to threaten the budgets. But overall, um, can you just talk a little bit about some of the problems of generating this much? I know you, you've mentioned the past siloization and some of the other issues that could go into having this this plethora of research. Well, first, uh, Cliff, uh, let me say that when I come out here and spend time at the Aspen Institute, I realize how little I know. Um, I also realize what a great privilege it is for me to work with people of science. I'm not a scientist. Amy has the same, my wife Amy, who is the executive director of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, has that same privilege, and both of us are very humbled by the fact that we get to work with people at NIH and people of science all around uh, our country and around the world. Um, I also find myself on two consecutive panels with Billy Towson. <laughs> now this is really tough because he's so darn good and then I found out before lunch how good Don is so I, uh, I'm even further humbled. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cliff did not mention, but the reason I was invited here is that I chair Research America. Research America is the only uh, group of 500 members, by the way, and includes academic health centers, hospitals, community health centers, uh, all kinds of people who care about uh, funding of research. And uh, Paul Rogers, who was a 24-year member of Congress and died very tragically last year, was the chair of Research America for nine years. And Paul would always end his speeches by saying, without research, there is no hope. So the number one payoff of research for the American people and for all humankind is hope. And there has been so great progress. And we haven't been funding it for all that long. NIH really uh, began about 1948 and didn't get ramped up uh, for a long, long time. 
And uh, to answer your question specifically, there is so much good science out there today that goes unfunded because we haven't put enough resources into it and so much progress being made from the science that is funded, uh, I think that the, the opportunity to really advance our knowledge of human health is to do more in the area of research. The President said at his speech at the National Academy of Sciences, we need to put 3% of our resources into uh, R&D, and we're nowhere near that. And it seems to me that uh, this is an area where we can really do things because we have such progress being made. And one of the big problems uh, of the last six years up until this administration was that research was flat funded. We did not have a, a stable commitment after doubling. We did not have a stable commitment to funding research and it all fell off. Um, now people uh, talk uh, a lot, and I might, I might say, let me say that Research America is primarily focused on funding for the National Institutes of Health. But that isn't the only place where we focus. We also advocate for CDC, for ARC, uh, for uh, NSF. Why do, we, why do we advocate for NSF? Because all the tools of biomedical research that have come on in recent years have been physical science tools that have allowed up us to move so quickly ahead in biomedical research. So it is also a function of this. And then it seems to me we also need to add FDA. What good does it do to do the research if you can't turn it into progress in human health? And if you talk to any member of Congress about why they're interested in funding research in the federal government, biomedical research in, or medical research in the federal government, they don't talk about support for the scientific enterprise. They don't talk about serving the academic health centers. They talk about progress in human health. And if you can't turn it into progress for human health, you are not going to get the support of policymakers. So we always start there. And I guess I've talked long enough. Well, you haven't talked long enough because we're going to keep coming back to you. But um, Congressman Towson, we, we actually have a good jumping off period here, which is – uh, Congressman Porter talked about uh, this great amount of unfunded research that's out there, and a lot of that is basic science research. And what uh, I'll give you a plug in the pharmaceutical industry in the United States contributes about $65 billion a year in research, uh, all told. Still going up? I'm sorry? It's still rising. And it's still right? rising, and it's been rising for a while. But one of the criticisms that's, that, that you hear about in the research community and also in the advocacy community is you've got basic science, you know, people putting, scientists putting their heads down in labs and working on, on animal models and, and, and petri dishes and whatnot. And then you have drug discovery happening in the pharmaceutical community, but you don't have this sort of bridge between the two. There isn't as much uh, uh, translational science, to use a buzzword. And then even post post-drug development, there isn't that much in terms of, of translating those drugs, trying to figure out ways in which they can be com better combined, uh, followed up in terms of their uh, safety profiles later on and when they're being used by lots and lots of people. So there are some gaps in the research continuum as well as what Dr. Berwick talked about, which is the continuum of care and what systems work. Can you talk a little bit about how you see this? and? Um, in addition to your role as, uh, as CEO of Pharma, also as a patient, because as some of you may know, you know, Dr. Congressman Townsend uh, went through a very difficult bout with duodenal cancer, uh, went through some very, very difficult procedures. The odds were probably pretty terrible to look at, and you've, you've come through this, and so you've had a, a sense of, of how medical progress can, can affect your life, certainly, let alone others. Well, let me first uh, thank both uh, Sir Don and, and, and my friend, my fellow congressman, for letting me join their panel. Uh, I think it's good for me, first of all, to, to lay down the frame of how research, we look at research from our perspective. Let me, let me first tell you that, uh, uh, by way of uh, perspective here, that I ran from health care for 24 years. I refused to serve on health care committees. It was too bizarre to work. I love telecommunications energy. This is too strange for me. And I became chairman of the committee. I, 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 you can imagine a steep learning curve. 
And that, that curve has really accelerated in the last four or five years. So when I speak to you today, please understand that, that like my friend Congressman Porter, uh, we're both bound by that wonderful English lit couplet that a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not this spring and spring. We're going we're gonna to drink deep today, and I apologize if we don't get it all right, but we're, we're learning as rapidly as we can. When I came out of uh, cancer and, and went to, um, came to pharma, I was still in chemo uh, for several months. Um, so I don't remember everything I did those first few months uh, because it was pretty heavy chemo by that time. But I do remember going to Genentech, to California, to meet the discovery team that for 15 years had worked on Avastin. I went there specifically to meet them, to know them, and to thank them for my life and for all the lives that they were working to try to save. It was a pretty moving moment. I mean, there was a lot of crying and hugging, and I remember they said, nobody comes back to thank us, Billy. I said, yeah, but you know, I'm in farm. I know where you live. You know, I could find you. And they paid my trip, so it was kind of cool. Um, I flew to Nutley, New Jersey, to, to meet the team at, uh, at Roche, who had co-sponsored and co-developed uh, Avastin and Zalota, which was another medicine that helped me through. And um, I, I started learning the incredible journey of research. Let me first tell you that in America, we're the envy of many places around the world because of the public-private partnership. And although there are gaps, there are transla translational medicine gaps, there are gaps in, in post-marketing uh, um, surveys. We're trying to fill that now through the uh, FDA, as you know, uh, since the last Paduva. And um, the, the bottom line is that we're still envied, and Europe is trying to copy what we've got. They're trying to set up an NIH uh, uh, to work with their comparable FDA. And there are other parts of the world can't look at wonder at us in terms of the way we put it all together. So let me give you the numbers. We do 70% of the world's research here in this country. And uh, the companies in Great Britain do their research here. Uh, the chairman of our board is a a chairman of AstraZeneca. Um, you know, we, all the major pharmaceutical companies in Europe do their, most of their research here. All the big Japanese pharmaceutical companies do their research here. I remember attending a meeting with Japanese uh, ministers, and they said, well, it's so good to see the American, representing the American pharmaceutical industry. I know, I said, I'm representing your industry too. They just happen to do all their work in America because we reward research in America, and you don't do a good job of doing that in Japan. Bottom line is that I learned from this first group what they go through, how many times the company exec, and Greg LaPointe is here with Sigma Tau, who does basic <coughs> research in, uh, in, in, uh, in applied sciences and tries to find cures for 7,000 rare diseases in America. This is hard stuff. Uh, Greg's company in Maryland uh, uh, is producing drugs for patient groups as small as 70. He knows every patient all the way up to, you know, the big ones who are doing blockbuster research uh, programs. It's amazing stuff. We do, as you said, 60, uh, almost 68 billion last year in, uh, in applied research into medicines. Uh, 48 are done by the companies within pharma every year. Uh, when you saw us put up 80 billion in the, in the healthcare reform, that's nearly two years of research, put it in perspective. Two out of 10 years gone when we, when we surrender 80 billion. Um, it, today, the, the research companies who do this research in America. We do 80% of the biologics, by the way. Those companies are, are playing in a 28% market field. Let me use some of Dean Kamen's numbers. 72% uh, of medicines in America are generic. 28 are patent. So we're playing within a 28% market. That market does all the funding for the pharmaceutical research, my pharmaceutical research in America. That 72% only has to pay for manufacturing marketing. 28% has to make enough money to pay for all that research, many times more than what the NIH does per year, and they're doing more thanks to the work John did. Um, when you think about that, and you realize that in the next few years, the percentage of generic use in America is gonna go to 85%, we'll be down to half of that percentage marketplace supplying the resources to do all the research that we currently do. Now, how do we get from here to there? Uh, how, do, how do we make sure that academia and our companies with the NIH and the other great institutions around the country still can maintain this level of leadership for the world? Those are big challenges that we, we are going to have to face. 
I can tell you, I hinted at it yesterday, yesterday I guess, lose track of time. When I said things are going to change, if you really want to get a perspective of how things are going to change, Dr. Uh, Clayton Christensen at Harvard just wrote a book called The Innovative Prescription. Um, pick it up and read it. There's a chapter, I think it's chapter 8 on, on our industry, predicts the future of industry. And he basically says, look, it's got to change. You can't use these old models that we currently use of 15 years of trial. And, and uh, we got 2,600 medicines being tested in clinical trials today. Each one of them can go over a billion dollars in 15 years of a 20-year patent protection life to develop them. That's what happened with Avastin. It was about $1.2 in work to develop it over 15 years. And they nearly gave up two or three times. Because in research, uh, Sir Don will tell you, at some points when you just don't know and, and you're looking at risk, Greg will tell you, at some points there, in the research uh, you know, uh, lag, there, there are points when you, when you evaluate the risk against success, and there are a lot of people in the company saying, pull the plug. It's just not going to work. We're getting some bad numbers back, and we're not getting the results we thought. And so many times when great medicines almost were lost in those moments. And when you think about that, uh, Dr. Christensen is basically saying, that's got to change. You can't have a 15-year model costing a billion bucks or more, and biologics is going to cost a billion and a half. We, we better darn well invent some more efficient models. Uh, now, research on rare diseases can be elite, can help us figure that out. Uh, orphan drugs uh, research can give us uh, fast track, biomarkers. We're doing a lot of things to help us figure that out. We've got a long way to go. Science, as I said yesterday, is running much faster than our, our, our connectivity in research and our policy and all the things we need to do to keep up with it. But what Christensen said in his book was, look, you're going to have to follow the Herceptin model. And then, I, then I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Herceptin was developed as a cancer drug for women's breast cancer. And instead of doing a trial on all the women with breast cancer, the, the makers of Herceptin, again, the company that made Avastin, went out and, and discovered that, uh, something we all know now, that there are many different forms of breast cancer. There are 52 different leukemias and 40-something different lymphomas. They're all different. When the president says we're going to go cure cancer, what he says, we're going to cure a lot of different cancers. There are lots of them, and they're all different. But the one they centered on was the breast cancer that was expressed with women who have the HER2 -E uh, biomarker, the genetic marker. So they focused not on a 20,000 clinical trial base that might take eight or 10 years. They focused instead on 547 women who had the HER2 marker. And they were able to accomplish the research in two years instead of five or 10 years. As a result, 120,000 women are benefited because of that medicine, ha handling their breast cancer, because we found a more efficient way of doing it, using the great science of genetics and, and disease pathways. He writes in his book that if you get cancer and you go to a hospital that, that's going to treat you on the basis of where the cancer is, organ, you know, gastrointestinal, heart, lung, you've been misdiagnosed. That the true science is leading us to disease pathways. Uh, the cancer I had in my duodenum was the same cancer my mother had in her uterus. Now, she didn't give me a uterus, so, you know, it just showed up somewhere else. It showed up in my duodenum. And as a result, same cancer, I had no carcinoma. Uh, I, we were able to treat it with a medicine that was approved for colorectal cancer. But you, you get my drift. We, we, we get approvals based upon where we find the cancer, when the truth is science is going to lead us to an understanding of approvals based upon disease characteristic biomarkers so what is Christensen telling us, and, I'll, and then I'll yield? He's telling us that the new research that is really going to benefit us, that is going to save so many more lives, that's going to reform and transform the way hospitals are designed, is a research that's going to be based on incredibly, incredibly effective diagnostics. Diagnostics done in terms of defining the clinical trial group, diagnostics built around the research, both from the academic se uh, sector the research done at, through NIH grants and the research we fund. It's a good day coming. But we had better not destroy the, the goose that laid the golden egg. We had better think about policies that maintain this incredible level of research in America. I'm a proud member of his organization. Yield back. Yeah. You know you have a congressman. Cliff, on the, Cliff uh, can I, can oh, I yeah, uh, make an intervention here? Because uh, I never answered your question. Um, 
NIH is uh, funded by an appropriation every year. It's not uh, some kind of entitlement. And, and uh, of late, there has been, uh, and, and by the way, 80%, better than 80% of all the money that goes to NIH is granted through peer-reviewed grants to academic health centers and other research institutions throughout the United States and in some cases even uh, into Canada and overseas. The, the attempt was made several years ago by the fellow who is now running in the Republican side for uh, the Senate in uh, Pennsylvania um, to uh, look at some research that was focused on sex. And somebody in your panel, Don, said the only people, the only thing that Republicans seem to know about research is that, they, that it deals with sex at times. Um, and he offered an amendment on the floor of the House of Representatives to cut out funding for particular peer-reviewed, already granted grant for research into something that he felt was concerning sex. That amendment got defeated by one vote. Now, I can tell you that through 60 years of its history, the Congress, which has power over this subject, has never, except in very unusual circumstances, substituted political judgment for scientific judgment. When we doubled funding for NIH and the president would come in with his budget and it would show what he thought and we wanted to do substantially more, what did we do? We called NIH and said, if you got 15% increase instead of a 2 or 3% increase, tell us how you would spend the money. And NIH would come back and say, this much for each institute. And we'd say, that's the way we're going to do it. And we never substituted our judgment for scientific judgment. And we never should ever, ever allow that to happen. The worst thing that can happen is being on the floor of the House of Representatives and have cancer against heart disease and diabetes against Alzheimer's. That is not where politics should be. That's not where government should be. It should be left to science. We should simply provide the resources. And they know where the scientific opportunities lay. That's how you win 12 straight terms, I guess. So, um, Dr. Berwick, uh, you know, we talk a lot about research for drugs and the drug development time. If you were to look, the Institute of Medicine a number of years ago, a couple of years ago, I guess, came out with a report uh, that, that gave us a frighteningly large number for the number of medical errors that were uh, conducted in, in, uh, in hospitals, that, that occurred in hospitals. If you were to put make medical errors a cause of death, it was something like number four or five as the leading cause of death in the United States. A lot of this stuff is dumb stuff, you know? I mean, we're, we're talking about Avastin and, and, you know, Herceptin, which are very sophisticated drugs that take years and years of development, and they're, fan they're fantastic in their own right. But here you have a lot of dumb stuff that can be corrected with a, a ra rather minimal amount of research or effort or focus. Can you talk a little bit about that? It's a little more complicated than that. Uh, yes, the, you're right about the study. I helped write that, and that was uh, we estimated this was in 1999. That was when the study appeared. That if you extrapolated for some research, between 44,000 and 98,000 Americans died each year in hospitals as a result of errors in their care. So that you're right. If it was 44,000, that would make it the eighth most common cause of death in America. And if it were 98,000, it was the fourth most common cause of death. What are these errors? They're, they're, uh, they're, first of all, it's a vast underestimate of the number of people injured by um, failure to get care that could help them, but you can't attribute it to an error. It's just we don't have very reliable systems, so it's actually only a piece of the problem. Uh, it looks simple, and it looks, uh, did you say silly? Or the, uh, I said dumb. Because dumb. Uh, uh, it is and it is. Most of my questions um, are dumb, so that's why. Yeah. Uh, Take, for example, communication errors. So uh, we're in a hospital, and uh, I'm about to give a patient a medicine that they're allergic to. And we already know it, but I don't know it. So that would have been one of those, could have been one of those deaths. It looks dumb, but you know, you gotta back up a second. I have four children, and I mix up the names of my two daughters all the time. I call Becca Jessica and Jessica Becca. I'm sure not sure, I'm still not sure which is which. We all do that. It's a human frailty to mix things up. 
So if you actually take these errors, and, and even the very worst ones, and you back upstream, it's not a careless doctor or a bad nurse or an uncaring individual. It's a human being suffering from a normal human frailty, maybe forgetting. Maybe, maybe a suture breaks. They, they look simple. Uh, other industries long ago learned to build dikes around human frailty. They, they buffer memory with reminders. They, they substitute automated systems when the human system is frail. In, in, in American healthcare, in all healthcare, we've glorified the role of the individual doctor or nurse as if they were heroically supposed to remember everything and do everything right. Well, no, that's not very smart. You have to build systems around. Then it gets a little complicated. The error may look silly, but the cause is subtle. Building human factors, systems around human beings, even the best doctors, so that they can work safely is a very, very difficult task. It's very, it's scientifically challenging. Uh, I'll, I, I don't want to go on too long, but I'll give you another example and then sure. I'll stop. Uh, my organization, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, mounted in, 19, in 2004 the, five, the 100,000 lives campaign, and then we followed with the 5 million lives campaign. It's simple. We just enrolled American hospitals. We asked them to carry out six silly, easy steps in the first campaign and 12 in the second. And any one of them, you'd say, what? you mean they don't do that now? One, for example, is rapid response teams. So if you look at patients die in hospitals, about half the deaths, there was premonitory signs, but the, but there's no response. The nurses worry about she can't get the doctor's attention, for example. A rapid response team is a way to intercept that early, and it works very, very well. Look simple. Try it in a hospital. Understand all of the complexities of communication, culture, leadership, interaction, role definitions, law, and, and you have to really engineer rapid response into a hospital. That, these are, these are uh, uh, looking at Dr. Nabel, thinking these are scientific matters. They're not they're not membrane transport. They're not genetic code matters, but they're very, very difficult issues in design. And, uh, and it isn't simple. Ask any hospital CEO. And, and, uh, so we, we could engineer safety in, but it's going to take more than just saying we're going to do it. And will this require a, a new research commitment? Yes. I mean, is this what we should be thinking about in our research com continuum? Since this is about the payoff of medical research, I just want to include this. Thanks to Congressman Porter, we already did that for, to some extent. Uh, uh, it, on his watch, ARC was... Uh, given the resources to begin quite aggressive research on safety, and it paid off a lot. DOD has done a tremendous amount. Of DOD facilities now have a lot of very nicely embedded uh, uh, technologies that support safety. The VA, the VA for several years was the world leader on patient safety research. So, we, yeah, absolutely, we can do it, and it is, it's an agenda. But safety is just a piece of this. Engineering, reliability, responsiveness, and efficiency into healthcare systems is as tough an engineering job as, as uh, you can see in any injury in, in industry. Speaking of tough and, and tough engineering jobs, Congressman Townsend, if, if you look at the investment that the pharmaceutical community has made and you look at the uh, investment that has been put into the NIH and to other, um, uh, under other research uh, funders, um, through the public se sector and, and private funders like the Komen Foundation yep. um, um, and the American Cancer Society, two, two great big funders of, of this. Uh, you would think that our productivity would be going up, but in terms of some metrics, what we're seeing is fewer new molecular entities, new chemical entities coming out, uh, being approved by the FDA. We're seeing longer times in, uh, to, to approval. We're seeing actually uh, Worse rates of success, it seems, according to an FDA study just a year ago, I'm um, saying. And, and so we're, from the late 90s, it seemed like we were a lot more productive than we are now, and we spent a lot less money. Can you talk about what some of those real-life barriers are that have nothing to do with money? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, let's start with, that, with our FDA. It, it's on life support right now. Dr. Hamburg really has a job on our hands. Uh, I mean, thankfully, we've, you know, we've got new funds coming into NIH, and Dr. Zahuni left it in great shape. The FDA is in, in, in wretched shape. It's lost a lot of its great talent. It's underfunded. It's gotten more missions than it could ever fund. Just got tobacco. Uh, it's got all this food safety that's unfunded. Uh, we put up almost 70 percent of the drug funding. That's not good. You know, they're our regulator. We ought to be under 50 percent. Congress ought to really beef it up so that we don't have that image. As much as the walls we set up, there's always a bad perception out of the regulated putting up most of the money. Uh, but, but let me make a more basic observation about our FDA. Uh, our FDA is a 19th century organization. It's 
trying to do a 21st century job. Uh, how many of you have children getting on computers and playing with kids in China? Our FDA can't do a digital filing. It's not equipped. It's not capable. I talked to the last commissioner, uh, uh, Dr. Vineshenbach. I said, can we help you? Can we do something to get you to go to see Bill Gates and see if he'll donate some equipment so you can do digital filings? We, we truckload truckloads of paper to, to the FDA when we when we try to get uh, you know filing on a new drug, and they got to go through paper when everybody else in the world is doing digital reviews and much more <coughs> accurate, much more predictable, much more secure uh, analysis uh, when you can do it that way, and yet uh, the process is is, uh, is is stymied by the fact that it's not up to modern standards of technology. It, it has lost a lot of its capabilities over the years. Add to that, and I'm, I'm sure John will agree with me, that it's, it's, uh, it went through the stem cell wars and the morning after wars and lost a lot of its credibility in terms of an independent scientifically based agency. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who believe, well, I just infected with politics now. And so it's, it's lost credibility while well, the comparable agency in Europe has gained credibility as a more of a pure, independent, scientific agent. That's a big barrier. Second thing is that, you know, let's go back to Vioxx and a few um, uh, situations like that where uh, things have occurred that, that have really caused everyone to be much more risk averse. Uh, safety becomes such a great concern that the benefit risk equation is now tilted. Now, you, you can argue, well, we should never forsake safety. We agree with that. But, but drugs development, drug use is a risk benefit equation, and we, we can't ever forget that. We take a risk crossing the street, but we think our products, uh, our, our medicines and our techniques, our facilities at hospitals should be risk free. No such thing. I, I always joke about it. If, if, if Americans didn't understand risk, how do you explain marriage? I mean, that's a pretty <laughs> risky venture. Uh, but we do understand risk in everything except our, our medicines and our, and our health care. Uh, and that has stymied the, the agency's ability to make decisions. So we're building in all the post-marketing surveillance now. Good thing to do, but it's going to slow the process down some more. And when you get to biologics, it's going to get even more complicated. I didn't, you know, I told you I didn't know a lot about this. And I, I'm still learning. But I went to a meeting with some of our scientists once. I asked them, tell me the difference between a chemical molecule and a, and a biologic. And they did a wonderful thing. They said, put a pencil dot right here. I did, and he said, that's a chemical molecule. The table is a protein with all these ends, all these complicated ends, and manufactured a little differently, you get a different protein. Store it differently, bottle it differently, you get a different protein. It's going to get complex. And we're already talking in policy about follow-ons in an area that's extraordinarily complex. So uh, I can only tell you that the complexities the out-of-dateness of the agency in terms of its capabilities, the underfunding, the risk-averseness are all adding up to a real slowdown in, uh, in drug approvals. And who suffers from that? By and large, it, it, there are two people who suffer. The folks who are trying to fund all this and make it work in a, in a structure, that, in a model that's getting increasingly uh, broken, and the patients who are waiting on the other end for all this new medicine. We have 360 new cancer drugs being tested. Now, I don't know which ones are going to be the big breakthroughs, but I can tell you, having gone through it, there are a lot of folks out there desperately waiting for them. And, and, and so that's part of the problem. I want to touch the other thing quick, quickly for you. I got cancer because I overused ibuprofen. So when you talk about medical errors, look at yourself first. We all look at ourselves first. I, I never read the label. I had fasciitis, plantar fasciitis from playing tennis. I started taking ibuprofen like they were candy, trying to get between the House and the Senate for meetings, et cetera, because I couldn't walk. And next thing you know, I got an ulcer. Next thing you know, cancer settles in. I don't bother treating the ulcer, so cancer comes in. Chronic inflammation, good site for cancer. Genetically inclined, bingo. I'm almost dead because I took too much ibuprofen over the counter. And my surgeon is the best in the country, and he committed medical error. He missed a lymph node that was in the, in the scan. And when he got through my surgery, he told me I was perfectly okay, only to find out, no, I had a 1% chance at that point. So medical error is, is, is happening it, with the best of doctors. I didn't, by the way, I didn't sue him. I didn't go get a trial lawyer and sue him or sue his hospital. 
I sat down and thanked God he was there to do his part, save my life. And, so and you, that, that's our problem. The lawyers are sitting over it. The risk averseness, safety concerns is, is beginning to stifle our ability to do our work. I'd love to throw that same issue out to the other panelists, and then I want to throw it out to the audience for questions. But, but you know, are we too risk averse? Let's combine medical research and, and, and issues of health care reform, since that, that's what this session is supposed to do. And, and ask the question, are we too risk averse? Are we too risk averse in our, in our cancer research? Are we too risk averse in, in all of our medical research? Um, you know, there was a, a, a famous example about a, a boy named Jesse Gelsinger years, uh, years ago that, uh, where there was a, 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 a gene vaccine. Um, and, you know, it was a horrible crisis, uh, I mean, a horrible tragedy where, where the boy died. And there, but it threw the whole industry into a crisis. And so we, there were a lot of people that said, you know, it's just one single incident that, that set back res the research agenda for quite some time. So and in the earlier session, Dr. Berwick's session, we, there was a lot of, I, I guess you would say, frustration in the audience about the pace of some of this medical, uh, uh, the, the pace of reform. So, so why don't each of you who haven't spoken about this uh, talk about whether we are too risk averse? If there's a deadly caution. Cliff, I'm, I'm bound and determined not to answer any of your questions. Um, because Don, Don and Billy can answer that question much better than I can. But I want to go back to two things. FDA. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> FDA. Uh, I mentioned before that we had a big problem in, in, in NIH being flat funded for six or eight years because our money was going to the Iraq War and Homeland Security. Um, everything other than those two things and veterans were flat funded for all that time. FDA, of course, was one of them. But in addition to that, there's a systemic problem with FDA funding. It's the Food and Drug Administration. I had under my jurisdiction all the health programs of the federal government except military and except FDA. Where was it funded? It was funded in the Agriculture Appropriation Subcommittee. And who wants to get on that subcommittee? Science-oriented members? Not at all. Farm-oriented members. So who gets the short end of the stick there? We really ought to, I, I've got to ask Peg uh, Hamburg this, but I, we really ought to think now in terms of dividing it into two agencies and putting the drug part under, under uh, Labor H, where I served, and putting the food part under agriculture so that they have, have a, uh, a logical division. Secondly, I want to, I want to talk for just a second about uh, uh, the, our commitment to research and how much the world looks to us uh, for research and what kind of leads we have. We have, have, have those leads, we've had those leads, are we going to keep them? We have a lot of competition out there from China, from India, from Singapore, from Europe now. And the question is, can we maintain our leads without making the investments necessary to do so? And my thesis is, of course, we cannot. We also have a problem with the education of our children. Science education at the uh, grade school level and high school level has deteriorated hugely in this country. Uh, STEM education really needs to get beefed up. One of the things I like to say is that uh, the only good thing that came out of this financial uh, downturn, this recession we've had, is that maybe all of our kids won't want to be stockbrokers anymore. <laughs> and wanted, some of them will want to go into science. We really need to have young people uh, not only educated in science but inspired to follow science careers. And I think one of the reasons FDA it, uh, doesn't have the kind of uh, reach it has is that we didn't provide the resources to attract the kind of people that really could have made a difference in that agency. So I, I think that uh, STEM education is really important for the country, and I think providing funding for FDA and giving Peg Hamburg the resources she needs to turn that agency around and bring it into the 21st century is terribly, terribly important. All right, so that was a better answer anyway than the question I, I had asked. I can answer. Which means, Dr. Berwick, you can answer anything you want. <laughs> I'll try to answer your question uh, about risk aversion. Uh, 
it, it's a complex matter. Let me, let me just be, be, try to make, be simple. Uh, stratify the question. There are some things that when we take care of patients, we should do every time the right way. And there we want, we want what they call Six Sigma reliability. We want parts per million reliability. That's how you want your airplane to fly. That's how we want a respirator to be managed. Uh, sure, doctors should be able to override it for reasons, but generally it should be highly reliable. We're highly unreliable. We are a parts per 10 system. So if you watch, watch us work for routine matters, healthcare gets it wrong about one in 10. Watch any process in a hospital. That's our characteristic reliability. The airplane you flew here on is parts per million. So we have a long way to go, and that's done through standardization, absolute commitment to reliability, strong leadership, a well-trained workforce, and automation when possible. It works very well. Uh, Mayo Clinic has halved its patient injuries in two years. I have the data. I've seen it. done it at all three sites, and they're very good, but they're not magic. They just do it that way. I got an email uh, a couple, last uh, two weeks ago, I think, from this hospital upstate New York's gone, I think it was three years, without one single ventilator-acquired pneumonia, not one. That was magic. And they did it through absolute standardization. The doctors have relinquished what they might have called autonomy, but they've given it up in service of reliability. And we can do that all through healthcare, absolutely. We shouldn't accept risk in those cases. But what uh, Representative Tauzin's uh, members do at some other end of the spectrum is very audacious. They're trying to solve problems no one ever solved before. They're trying to fly fighter jets that are for the first time. You can't have absolute safety and audacity at the same time. And one of the things you're so proud of for your industry is a kind of audacity, saying we're going to fix this for the first time. And if the public doesn't understand the difference, if they ask audacious systems to be risk-free, uh, we're wrong. If we ask simple systems to act as if they're audacious and everyone gets to do what they want to do, you get junk. So it's, we gotta be smart as a public and as a Congress to decide when we standardize and when we don't. The third is the legal system. Now, we do operate under a terrible cloud there. There's a mature answer. It would be to go to some no-fault compensation system, end of story, and just get us out of this very, very wasteful and nonsensical litigation environment. But that's not my strength. With respect, well, I think I'll stop. Oh, what the heck. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Uh, go for it, it has to do with the government's role in standard setting. Uh, I think one of the things that annoys uh, your members and you uh, is the threat that the government will put on handcuffs when you need the freedom to do stuff. On the other hand, I would argue that you need and want government to do that, that you, that's how we build trust in the public, that, that to say we have a government, it's our servant, and not, all, not our master, but we need it to make decisions better than we could individually, and that's why I like the standard setting aspects of government that do look a little bit restrictive, a little like we're too risk averse, but I, we can go into that more if you want. I'm sorry, that too long. No, no, it's, it's terrific. I, and think that's we just have, I would love to get some questions from the audience. We don't have that much time, but let's see if we, we've got a question right here. Yeah, I think this panel is probably one of the most important panels we've had this whole weekend. And I think the one thing we've not been hearing in health reform is just what you were saying. No one's dealing with the cost of litigation for all of healthcare system. No one's talking about tort reform. No one's talking about med, med malpractice caps. They tried it in some states. Senator Kyle told us on Thursday in Washington that it's worked in Arizona. We know it's worked in Wisconsin. You cannot get uh, high-risk surgery in Northern <coughs> Illinois other than the city of Chicago. You're going to go up to Wisconsin. That's where all the neurosurgeons and everybody would move because the cost of insurance in Illinois is so crazy. Congressman Porter, thank you for all the help in Northern Illinois you've given us, but we're very involved with the University of Chicago Medical School in the Northwestern and Rush, big three hospitals in Chicago. If I told you that each one of these hospitals had to put $25 million a year into their um, medical malpractice self-insurance, that's probably an understatement. But when you get to the drug development, exactly what you were saying, we cannot move science forward if everybody's got to look over their shoulder at trial lawyers all the time. And until the Democratic actually, Bill, yeah, sorry, I said this, until the Democratic Party stops meeting on tort reform donations or tort lawyers uh, donations, we're not going to get there. But Obama said this to me five years ago. He said, "Well, I need the lawyers to win this Democratic nomination. Oh, I need them to win the Senate." Now he's president. He's not against it. So the whole problem we have is until tort reform is put into the medical system, we're not going to fix the system. We're not going to fix it because it costs the medical system way too much and it hinders medical research and science. 
And every, you know, every time there's an error, and everybody who's in an entrepreneurial area of business knows you make mistakes when you take risks, how do we think you're not going to make mistakes when you're in a hospital or you're developing scientific either equipment or developing farming? And the problem is somebody should say, let's take some risks so we can have audacious science. Let's take some risks so we can have better hospital, hospital care at lower cost. You're not going to fix lower cost hospital care without doing that. can't happen. You don't have it in Europe, and you don't have it in Japan. So when people are saying, oh, these other countries got as good a care with lower cost, guess what? We got more lawyers in Washington than the whole country of Japan. You know, so obviously they have less medical costs because they have less legal costs. So unless we reform that, I think this whole issue about lowering costs is out of the question. Okay, let's see if we have another, oh, right here, Dean Kamen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Sorry to be <coughs> seem like the easiest one with the biggest return and at least in the recent past as I've talked to people it doesn't seem like compared to the money they're throwing at the energy programs or they're throwing at other programs it doesn't seem like they're throwing lots of money at quickly trying to reverse the trend of not funding all the research particularly in, in life science and medicine why? Well um, he's referring to the uh, era or stimulus money I assume which, uh, when the president proposed the stimulus, there was not a big amount of money in for NIH. The, the $10 million, $10 billion, came from an amendment by Arlen Specter. And you got to remember that NIH was not thinking in terms of receiving this $10 million, and they had to impl implement uh, what they did with it in, in, in a very quick uh, time frame. Uh, the intent of the money was not – Ireland's intent was to help science. The intent of the money in the stimulus was to make jobs and improve the economy. So they wanted to shovel the money out as fast as possible, create jobs, and get things done. 
So um, I don't know whether I'm answering your question here. I guess since there's all these young researchers that have... Opened why, why doesn't the president put this in at a big, a big uh, amount for the next fiscal year? Or even if they said we want to get jobs right away, there's all this work that has been done... Well, two year, a, a two-year time frame, and by the time you get the money out, it's about a year and a half at the most... This isn't a very good time for funding science. I think Betsy will enable to tell you that that's, it doesn't work well for science. It's too short. Uh, and they have, they have done some things to, to fix that. The president has said, uh, we have to address, uh, the funding of research, all research. And he's looking at, uh, the underfunding of the physical sciences first, because if you remember rising above the gathering storm, the NIS report, uh, we have really neglected the physical uh, sciences. They did not get doubled at the time that uh, NIH got doubled because, well, they weren't under our jurisdiction. They were under different jurisdiction, another silo problem. So I think he's, I think he's intending, he said in the NAS speech, he wanted to double funding for medical research over 10 years, not five. But that's, that's about a 7.5% per year, maybe a little bit less than that. Um, and, and right now, the, the deficit problem is a very serious problem. We've, we felt fortunate to get a billion-dollar increase in the bill this year from the House that just passed on, on uh, last Friday. Um, we're hopeful to do better than that, but I think getting at least biomedical research until we can begin getting a real ramp-up and the president intends it and the economy improves to afford it, it seems to me that that's probably the best we can hope for. And, and uh, Research America wants 10 percent. Uh, others have different uh, feelings about that amount, some at three and a half, some at seven. Uh, but we agree with you that this is a, a very, very high priority for our country, for our economy, for uh, our future. 10 percent increase over last year. Give me some numbers, Dean. You like numbers? Uh, China is educating 42 percent of its kids in science and engineering. Singapore is up to 67 percent. We're well below 15 now. We're falling in. Uh, we've lost 30 percent of our PhDs in science and engineering over the last uh, few years. China is now paying Chinese scientists who come to America to go back to China. Big bonus. They call them sea turtles. They're going to swim back to China and lay their scientific eggs on Chinese shores. Uh, it's, it, the, the world of competition is leaving us behind. The share of, uh, of publication from American scientists uh, compared with the rest of the world is going down. Down rapidly. Well. But uh, I wanted to give Dr. Berwick a chance to uh, at least touch upon the tort reform issue. It, it, this is a, a minor point, but I don't want to be mis misunderstood or misquoted. Uh, uh, over a beer, I'm, I would come to agree with Gordon, but I, I don't quite agree with, with the, what you said, I want, and, and, and I may be wrong. But uh, I am very much in favor of tort reform. We have an inequitable system that does not adequately compensate people who are hurt and creates a lot of extra costs uh, that are just waste. I don't think caps work. Uh, this, my, my analyses of what's gone on in Texas and other states show that it isn't the cap that did it. And we have much better models for uh, very productive, very mature tort systems at the, in the private sector. The uh, University of Michigan has been now for years, uh, five years, working what they call a policy of extreme honesty. It's, it's a more complex policy of complete disclosure, apology, some agreed upon uh, settlement, uh, remedy upstream so it doesn't happen again, uh, and it works. Uh, uh, their total liability costs have fallen by more than half. There are many more patients are getting compensated, but at a more reasonable amount, and it's not being done by a heavy-handed uh, cap. Caps will erode public trust. They'll think we're, that there's a shell game going on, and we don't need it. We, we just need an environment in which disclosure, apology, remedy, and mature prevention uh, are the mainstay. Mo I believe that it, that would get us 80 percent of the way to the solution. Uh, any questions? Uh, this lady right here. Uh, I, have, I have one question, which is there's a serious problem within, the, I think, the AMA. There are a lot yes. of doctors that are very, very inadequate and would seem to not be able to get them out of the system. And it kind of, if you'll excuse me, reminds me of a lot of the government agencies in D.C. that I have friends who are head of and they can't really fire somebody, they shift them to somebody else's department. Yeah. And what can we do about that? Because they're causing a lot of the errors, the same doctors. Uh, I'm, I'm 
taking a big risk here. Uh, <laughs> they're not. They're a tiny proportion. Uh, yes, we need to recalibrate to what we know from science, which is that the vast majority of ways that people get hurt, the injuries to patients are not occurring because individual doctors are sloppy, careless, or, 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 or uh, in doing anything that, that, that other, other than trying to do their best. They're caught in very, very fragile systems, and they're just human, just like you and me. I'm going to trip when I walk out that door. They'll trip in the OR. Here it's a, you know, it doesn't matter. There it does. You're right, though, that the very small percentage of bad actors, and they're there, they're people who yell at the medical student, who throw the instruments, who are, who are substance abusing but not yet detected, we don't, do, we don't act on those people. And, and there's a culture, a very strong culture of slow action, and there, there's, there's a due diligence here. The profession earns public trust by, by policing itself. But I think you'd help as a citizen more if you could just get the proportions a little right in your head, that, that most of these injuries are not occurring that way. They're good people trying hard in bad systems, and we absolutely need to hold boards of trustees and medical staff and others accountable for getting those tiny few to, to get corrected or out. And maybe that something we could talk about more. Uh, can, can, I, can, I, can I add something? Cool, yeah. the, the whole tort reform thing, and I'm, I'm sorry to say that it's a DOA on health care reform. It's no, not going anywhere this time. But it is sort of the, the poster child for whether we are going to commit ourselves to special interests at, at the cost to society or whether we are going to sweep away some of these interests and do major reform that's going to make a difference for the patient and make uh, uh, human beings healthier in our country. This is what health care reform is all about to me. It's all about getting beyond serving all these interests and getting something done for the country. Yeah, well, I, I know we got a lot of questions. I just want to add, I'm a recovering trial lawyer, okay? So uh, I'll put it on record. Uh, yeah, we got too much litigation in the system. It's much too costly. I passed, I think, the last uh, uh, reform effort when we did the medical device bill through my committee because we were losing all the raw materials to go into medical devices because the companies were facing so many lawsuits that the cost of the lawsuits they were winning outweighed the profit they made from the sale of the materials used in medical devices. And I didn't pass that bill by making a big case against lawyers. You know, Shakespeare said, kill all the lawyers, and, and uh, Vice President Cheney tried, you know, but the problem is that's not a good remedy. The bottom line is that uh, we brought in patients, brought in a young girl who needed a titanium shaft replacement who wouldn't have the material to, to grow up and walk, much less dance ballet. We brought in a young kid who had the hydrocephalic and needed replacement shunts. Wouldn't have them if, if the liability continued because these companies were getting out of the business. And we changed the law. We changed it because we convinced the members of Congress this was a patient issue. Patients were suffering. We're not going to win it to save our companies or doctors from lawsuits. That's not going to win it. People will expect us to be sued when we make mistakes, and we, we make mistakes. We all do. And we should get sued when we harm people because of our mistakes. That's part of our system. We understand that. The problem is that we've got to somehow convince America that it's gone too far, that now it's hampering our common ability to serve America's patients. We've got to start making that argument. Okay. You've been waiting. Oh, let's, all right. Let's get a question from you, and then the gentleman in the back. You can, got one here. Uh, the gentleman here. The been waiting. One, two, and three. Okay. Sorry. So, Representative Tosin, this is for you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I wanted to quote what Dr. Berman just said a moment ago, that um, a profession earns public trust by, I think you used the word self-regulation? Okay. Yes, if, her, if it doesn't, it'll lose yeah, public, it'll lose public yeah. trust. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Um, I've been deeply concerned about the lack of public trust in the pharmaceutical profession and um, am eager uh, to know to what degree, you know, you mentioned as a as a sign of the worst case, if the pharmaceutical industry, which is supposed to be regulated by the government industries that we have, is actually providing uh, the majority of funding, you said something like 70%. 70%. Said, I mean, your wrinkles your nose just like that. <laughs> it's yeah. a bad situation, and we yeah. know that. And I work with medical students, and um, there's just a good deal of disdain for pharmaceutical industries, which I think is, is a pity because we need the pharmaceutical so I'm just wondering, um, I came in late, excuse me, if there's been any mention about self-regulation of the pharmaceutical industry so that this area, and what, what change of system, you know, because I consider malpractice and tort reform a consequence of the system we have. Yep. And we are talking about fundamental change of system. So 
what change of system can you envision and have your industry been working on in order to self-regulate and to redeem is a religious term, I don't want to use that term, but to good. restore public trust in the pharmaceutical industry? Right, now that's a good question. Uh, we've been about that task for the last five, four and a half years since oh, I've been there. Yeah. The first was the adoption of the DTC code, which was to begin the self-regulation of ads on television. Now, we haven't finished that. We, uh -huh. we, we, we do review it every year. We strengthen it every year with the advice of physicians and others in the healthcare community. How can we, how can we make them more uh, educational, less promotional? Right. We've been working on that, and the companies have volunteered on uh, two occasions now, not only to adopt the code unanimously, uh, but also to now to set up um, uh, amendments to it is recommended by a lot of folks who've been watching this process as well as to begin an on-site where people can come in and make complaints and we can take them to the companies and et cetera. So Farm is doing trade association best to uh -huh. get the industry to do a better job on that, frankly. Yeah, do, yeah, more, do, educational yeah, than do than more disease than education, right. more promotion, less uh, jumping in the air talking yeah. about their products. Yeah. Um, the second thing is a very important one, that's in marketing. Uh, I don't have to tell you a lot of complaints about, you know, uh, our salesmen and the way they engage with academicians, the way they engage with, we just adopted a new code of conduct on, on marketing that eliminates all the meals and restaurants with doctors and all the, uh, all the gimmies, all the stuff you hand out. The salesmen used to hand out all the little trinkets and coats and cups and saucers and pens. All that's gone. All the chachas, you know, whatever they call those things. And uh, also some new regulations on funding of, uh, educational system, uh, uh, settings for b the interactions, if you will, between our, our uh, people and the, the doctors who need to know about the medicines. All the, we've got new standards by which we don't, we don't um, um, have a, a fund events there that uh, we, we can fund the people putting on the educational form, format, but we can't fund individual events. They do all the funding. We're separating as professionally we, as we can the dollars from the educational experience, but also trying to maintain a, a, a real sense of connection between those of us who are trying to make products and teach physicians about their safety margins, their efficacies, how to use them, how to interact with other medicines. And lastly, we just adopted, uh, we've been in the process of adopting new codes on clinical trials. Uh -huh. uh, and before I got there in, in 2003, I think it was, it, they adopted a rule to make all the clinical trials before 2002 public. Since then, we've, we've adopted new rules to provide transparency on ongoing clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So that there's a, and that's all posted on websites for people to see. Good, bad, and ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, it all goes on, on the report on the website. So we're, we're moving for transparency, for self-regulation in the way in which we market and advertise. And we're constantly revising and, and looking at those areas to see if they're problems. Uh, I, can t I can tell you as a doctor did uh, that I, I've been amazed at how much the people I'm now working for care about what they do. Mm -hmm. They don't want to hurt people. They want the medicine to be safe. They don't want to behave inappropriately. They want good professional relationships with doctors and patients. And to a large extent, um, we're beginning to achieve that in public awareness. When I came to Pharma four years ago, our public standing was 38%. We're 55 today in the latest surveys. Harris National Survey said that we are the only sector of the U.S. economy, the only industrial sector that has moved up since 2007 in public approval. I believe that's connected to those efforts. Mm -hmm. We've got to do more. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Don is just exactly right. For industry, I've done this all my life with industries that, that were regulated or somehow governed by Energy and Commerce Committee. I've always instructed, please self-regulate yourself. Otherwise, Congress has to step in, and that's not the best answer. My best, i give you an example of that was the motion picture industry and the television industry. Uh, there were bills in Congress to regulate them, to, to have government censuring what you saw on television. I didn't let that happen. I went to Peoria, Illinois, and I got uh, the Motion Picture Association, the cable industry, the broadcasters to all come there and meet the families in Peoria and talk to them about what their families were seeing on television. Mm -hmm. And they went back home and, and devised a rating system that parents now have to at least know what's coming on these programs so they can better regulate their children's viewing habits. Mm -hmm. Self-regulation works. We're at it. Uh -huh. We'll never do enough, but we'll keep trying. So it's just one teeny, teeny little question, which it has to do with, with your heart. Yeah. Could you ever imagine a context, a request from the population that 
corporate nature of pharmaceuticals could slowly phase itself out and no profits would be made, no profits would be made from research, still function as a business, you can't in your heart of hearts. No, no. I mean, it's a privately invested enterprise. I know as a corporation you're legally obligated, so you can't imagine that. I can't imagine. I can tell you this, though. There are areas where charity and that sort of thing is very appropriate. Our PPA program is a good example. We're now giving away to 6 million Americans free medicine because they can't afford it. That's a place where we can do good. Okay. Thank you all. I'm sorry to the gentleman in the back and to this gentleman. Please approach our panelists privately. I want to thank these panelists. Terrific. We got to leave on the word audacity, which is the thank you very much. Thank you.